This is Attorney Gerald Griggs, the Justice Fighter. I don't think they ready for you, Attorney Justice Griggs. Fighter. What's going on, everybody? It's Attorney Gerald Griggs, the Justice Fighter, and we are here on Justice Fighter Podcast on the Justice Media Network, and I am just honored and pleased to have one of my favorite people in Georgia politics, uh, Representative Renita Shannon. How you doing, Representative Shannon? Great. Thank you for having me. Okay. I'm excited to talk about what's going on down at the Gold Dome. So first things first, uh, you've been in session how many days now? I think that this is day 15. Day 15. And I see a lot of interesting things coming out of the uh, Georgia General Assembly. But what what's on our radar? What should be on our radar for what's happening down there? Well, there are two really troubling bills um, that have popped up that I'm hoping that there will be enough public pushback that these bills won't move. But basically, the first bill um, is a bill that seeks to make carrying hemp illegal. And so the background on this is that last year, we as a General Assembly um, legalized farmers in Georgia being able to commercially grow hemp. Mm -hmm. And as a result, after session was over, we started to see newspaper articles talking about how, you know, um, now that hemp has been um, legalized to carry in the state, police officers can no longer distinguish hemp versus marijuana because it looks so similar, they smell similar. And so DAs around the state decided that they were not going to be able to prosecute people for um, having marijuana on them because, again, unless you have a test, and the tests are very expensive to distinguish right there on the road when a police officer pulls you over, um, whether or not this is hemp or marijuana, you could be arresting somebody for a substance that is completely legal at the federal level. That's So hemp is completely legal at the mm -hmm. federal level, so that's important to remember. So, um, in effect, this has, this has had the effect of DA saying we're not going to be able to prosecute marijuana because we just don't know if this is marijuana or if it's hemp, and it's too expensive to buy these tests for police officers to be able to perform on-the-spot testing. So, with that, some politicians this session decided to come back with a fix. Mm -hmm. And the fix is that now they want to make carrying hemp illegal unless you have a card that you're a com showing that you're a commercial grower. But on the federal level, it's already legal. Correct. Correct. So this is Georgia basically going around the federal mm -hmm. government and, and re recriminalizing something that's already legal. That's correct. And the animus behind all of this is that uh, the, you know, the folks who are moving forward with this bill, which, by the way, let me just say there are both Democrats and Republicans on this bill, mm -hmm. um, are basically trying to make sure that we do not move towards legalizing marijuana. And so their answer to that is just to criminalize hemp so that if officers find you with any green leafy substance, they can just arrest you and treat it as if you definitely have marijuana. So I thought Georgia, under the last administration, was trying to move towards, you know, criminal justice reform. It sounds like we're going backwards now. We are absolutely going backwards. And it's interesting that you bring that up because we have had folks on both sides of the aisle take mention and notice of the fact that Governor Kemp is undoing a lot of criminal justice reforms that we know work. Mm -hmm. um, studies have shown and our numbers have gone down as far as our incarceration rates. These reforms like diversion courts, um, these reforms like moving away from long sentences for folks, mm -hmm. um, these types of reforms are working in Georgia. And his administration is determined to take us backwards into a situation where we would undo all of the criminal justice reform progress that we have made. And I stress again, it is not just Democrats, liberals saying this. There are even conservative groups saying, why in the world would you want to start? Why in the world would you want to stop doing something that we have proof is working? And so let, let's talk about some of the rollbacks. So he's in his budget. He's, he's pushing back and rolling back funds for the uh, accountability courts. Is that right? Well, that was a part of the, so initially he came out and said that he was going to take, th uh, I think it was $3 million away from um, public defenders and give it to prosecutors. Mm -hmm. So that right there is, you know, setting up a situation where you're going to be increasing mass incarceration because if a person can't afford an attorney, they de depend on public defenders who are mm -hmm. already overworked, overloaded. Um, every, county will, every county will tell you they don't have enough public defenders to really be able to defend, uh, to defend everybody adequately. So the interesting thing is, is that this year people really paid attention to the budget and mm -hmm. there was a lot of public pushback on some of the things that he was doing, especially, especially in the areas of criminal justice reform. And so you saw a lot of people, you saw a lot of outpouring saying, hey, don't remove funding for public defenders. This is the wrong direction for us to go. And then interestingly enough, prosecutors went to the governor and said, listen, if you remove funding 
for public defenders, you are throwing our balance off because then people could come back and say that they didn't have a public defender or adequate representation. And so our courses, our cases could be thrown out. And in fact, if it comes down to it, we will give some of the funding you're giving to us back to public defenders because you really are, you know, it would be a disservice to our system and you'd be messing up the work that we do as prosecutors. So as a result, that did not make it into the budget. So okay. that, that, that funding was not cut. And there are some other areas where the governor was really aggressive about cutting public services that in the end, simply because of public pushback, those cuts were not made. And so let's talk about it. I, I think there's a lot of energy uh, in um, in Georgia politics recently with communities starting to push back. Are you feeling that effect um, from the engagement of, of citizens? I know last year, uh, around the uh, heartbeat bill. There was a lot of protests. You were part of the mm -hmm. protests. Of course, around voter uh, suppression, there mm -hmm. were protests and arrests in the Gold Dome. Uh, so are you still feeling that same energy carrying over to this year uh, um, around the legislative session? Absolutely, I am. And I will say, uh, first, let me state, it's not enough. We need more people to get engaged and okay. actually pay attention to what is going on. And we need Georgians to continue to step up and, and say that, you know, and have their voice heard. But absolutely, we're seeing a continuation of the public starting to get involved. And I think the budget is a great example of that because when this budget initially rolled out, you saw so much pushback um, from folks who said these are not our priorities. This is not what we want to see in Georgia. And as a result, the governor had to change a lot of the um, harsh cutbacks that he had planned. And for example, as we talked about before, removing some funding for public defenders. So and it's interesting because if you think about it in years past, I've never seen people posting about the budget on Facebook. No, absolutely not. I've never seen this many newspaper articles about the budget. Usually the budget is just something that mostly, unless you're a legislator, nobody really pays a whole lot of attention to it. But this year you saw people engaged and ready to step up and say how they felt about what was going on. Well, that's, that's good. I'm glad that that's having a profound effect. I want to kind of talk uh, in generalities about a bill I think that was, was um, placed in the hopper on the 21st and now has a first read on the 24th is the governor's gang uh, gang bill, mm -hmm. uh, House Bill 994. Uh, are you familiar a little bit with that bill? I am. Mm -hmm. So what do you think uh, about the bill? I, I know that it's going to allow for 13 to 17 year olds who are engaged in criminal gang activity, whatever that means, uh, <laughs> will be charged as adults and tried in Superior Court. It also enhances the punishments around criminal gang activity. Um, what do you feel the onus is behind this? So again, as I said before, the governor is making, tr attempting to make many changes that will take us back in the areas of criminal justice reform. In years past, especially under Governor Deal, but just in general, we have seen people fighting to increase the age of which a child could be um, you know, prosecuted as an adult. SB we, 440s. Yeah. That's right. So we have seen bill after bill trying to raise the age to make sure that we are not treating children who have made mistakes in the same ways that we would treat adults, which we, you know, regularly talk about how the criminal justice system has the power to ruin an adult's life. We certainly don't want to have that happen to children. And so this bill is another example where the governor, we, we have reforms that are working. We can prove that they are working. And here is the governor coming in, talking about how we have an epidemic of gang violence, which I'll tell you, I'm not going to say that this issue isn't important to anybody, but my constituents do not report that gangs are their top priority. My constituents are saying things like, I still don't have health care coverage. Yeah. I'd like it if you'd expand Medicaid. Yes. We still don't have enough services for mental health treatment, and our jails are being used as mental health treatment services, which... Anybody who knows anything about how a jail works, um, prison works, that is not the place that you can actually get mental health treatment. But now those those centers have become mental health treatment centers and some of the largest providers of mental health treatment, because instead of helping people, we're just incarcerating them. So there are a lot of things that the governor is doing that I think really is just about politics, but it's not about actually looking at, you know, what the, the reform, looking at the progress that we have made by sticking to policies that actually make sense rather than what you have campa campaigned on. Yeah. And I think, you know, he's running on uh, uh, trying to create a climate of fear. Absolutely. Um, I believe the GBI said that crime statistics are actually down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I believe they right. believe that um, activity by criminal street gangs are actually mm -hmm. down. Right. Um, and there are supposedly 71,000 documented gang members, but mm -hmm. in a state of 10 million, mm -hmm. 
that's not even what one percent. And I would challenge that number because when you look at the statue of how gangs are defined, um, defined correct. The statue is so loose, it basically says three or four people who have come together to do criminal activity. I mean, that is so loose that essentially anything could be considered a gang. You know, the interesting, so I'm glad you brought up the point about fear because this governor is really, really afraid that he will not see another term. And that's because we know that Stacey Abrams, and I know this is not a political show, but I'm just going to lay it on the line for you. Stacey Abrams won that gubernatorial election. She did. Um, governor Kemp only was able to win on paper because he suppressed the votes of so many people who wanted to come out and actually have their voice heard, but they couldn't because o over the years he has been doing lots of things to suppress and make it harder for people to vote and express, you know, who they would like to vote for. And so I think that he is very afraid um, that Stacey Abrams is going to come back. And so as a result, he is trying to stoke fear in Georgians to say, listen, continue to elect me because I will be tough on crime, which we know is not, a, those, those policies do not work. Um, a lot of times elected officials don't like to admit it. I say it all the time. I mean, these tough on crime policies really just have the effect of um, disproportionately incarcerating black and brown people. That's really the bottom line. Definitely. And I want you they to don't make us any safer. I want you to feel comfortable. This is a political show. So oh, we can get okay. we can get political. <laughs> um and, and that's one of the reasons for Justice uh Justice Fighter podcast. Um but you know, one of the things I really wanted to talk about is what how can the average citizen get engaged in Georgia politics? I know there's been a reawakening politically, nationally, but mm -hmm. on a local level, how can a, a regular citizen get engaged? Well, so there are quite a few things that you can do. Number one, um, everybody has a state representative and a senator um, that represents them. Find out if they have email distribution lists. I have one that I do every week, and my um, distribution list, which if you want to sign up for it, go to RenitaShannon.com, and you can click the sub subscribe link. Um, but, for example, my list is not a – the weekly update that I send is not an update – that is, you know, hey, look who I took a picture with this week. I talk about issues that you need to know about, bills that you need to know about, and I show you the way to actually engage in fighting against or supporting correct legislation. The other thing is, is that a lot of times I find out that people, a lot of times I find that people um, who are not elected officials don't understand that everything that we do is essentially recorded. Um, you can actually, you don't have to come down to the Capitol in order mm -hmm. to see what we're doing. You can just go on the General Assembly website um, and take a look at it and see how we're debating bills. You can see what we're talking about. You can see what we're talking about in committees. So, for example, if criminal justice reform is a passion for you, then that means that you would need to look at everything that the Public uh, Safety and Homeland Security Committee does and also judiciary, because that's where we see the bills that have to do with criminal justice um, reform go into those committees. And that is where a lot of the bad bills really uh, come through. So there are a lot of ways that people can stay engaged. The other thing I would say is people should follow folks like yourself. You're always on these issues. You're always talking about the issues and you're always giving people an opportunity to get engaged. So get somebody that you trust who is vigilant about issues and then sign up for their emails, sign up for this podcast, because then th th it's a situation where you're proactively bringing information to people so they don't have to do a whole bunch of research. Exactly. And so the, the website that you were talking about, you can watch the live stream. What is that website so people can actually just watch committee hearings and watch floor debate and watch the votes? What's the website? Uh, let me actually, let me get back to you on the exact okay. website. But if you Google Georgia General Assembly, it's something like L-E-G-I-S. Yes, that's it. That, that's that it. shows you yes. I'm a political junkie because I watch that website. <laughs> But yes, definitely tune in to that live stream. You can see all of the committee hearings and all the votes and all the um, everything that happens in the uh, Coverdale Legislative Building and on the floor. Also, uh, let me just mention another thing. The other thing that's on that website is it shows you how everybody voted on a bill. And one thing that I see over and over again is that when it comes to criminal justice reform, people are underestimating um exactly who is voting for these bills. Yes. So you see bipartisan agreement in, in, in passing policies that will increase mass incarceration. And so it, it really is coming out of the theory that too many people have not awakened to the understanding that over incarceration and being tough on crime um, is not, does not make us safer. It does not actually uh, reduce crime and it's not the way for us to go. But you still have so many people who've been elected for so long who, you know, 
really have not changed their philosophy on how they think about criminal justice. Exactly. And so I want to kind of talk about that because we were kind of talking about a bill offline and talking about uh, certain Democrat support for the bill. But how can people find out who these Democrats are that are just continuing to cross party lines for bills that are not good for their their community and good for their constituency? How can they find out who these individuals are and hold them accountable? Sure. So when you hear of a bill number, what you need to do is go to the site, as we just talked about, um, the Georgia General, General Assembly site, and you type in that bill number. As soon as you go to the front page there in the left hand column, it says legislation. Mm -hmm. And excuse me, if, if you are hearing about a bill like, let's say, for example, HB 500, mm -hmm. that means it's a House bill. And you need to just type in um, 500 and you'll be able to pull up HB 500. And the first five names at the top, it tells you who's sponsoring the bill. So look at who those people are. Mm -hmm. The top five sponsors of any bill are the folks who are really driving the bill. Okay. So that's how you. So so pretty much, you know, what I'm saying is we spend a lot of time, especially in politics, um, as I will say, on the progressive side, um, talking about how only one party is advancing policies that um, add to mass incarceration. And it's just not true. There are too many Democrats who are advancing these same policies. And the only way that that is going to stop is by constituents calling their legislator to let them know, I don't want you to support this. Okay. And so um, one of the follow-up questions that I have is, is, so we start to have accountability by seeing who's voting for what, start to track their record. Um, but how do we get in touch with our local elected officials? Do they have office hours? Do we, should we call them, email them? How would we get in touch with them once we find out, yeah, that's a bad bill like House Bill 9, 9 uh, 94 that everybody needs to call their state reps mm -hmm. on. But how do you continue that conversation? Yes. So again, on the General, Georgia General Assembly website, all of the contact information is listed for every single rep and a map. So if you don't know if you live in a person's district or you don't know who is your representative, you can either go to the Georgia General Assembly website and it will tell you. You can also go to votesmart.org. Uh, so votesmart.org. That allows you to put in your address um, and then it'll tell you who your representatives are. In addition to on Facebook, there is on the left hand column, there's a little button that says town hall. It mm -hmm. tells you who your representatives are. Okay. So if you go to the Georgia General Assembly website, you will see email um, contact information for your representatives. So you can directly email them. You will see phone numbers. And in addition to a lot of elect, most elective officials do have a website even outside of the government information that's listed. So again, just simply Google if you know who your representative is and it will not be hard to find a phone number or an email address for them. The other thing is, is that, so the Georgia General, General Assembly is in session for 40 days every year. Mm -hmm. Those days do not run consecutively. So it basically every year we're in session generally January through March, um, sometimes going into April. And so um, this is a situation where you can find us at the Capitol. You can come down, put in a ticket, pull us out over the ropes and tell us how you feel about any bill anytime. Okay, that's mm -hmm. good to know. Um, so you went viral uh, a couple weeks ago for a, a police accountability bill. Um, I think it was uh, shared on blacknews.com over 225,000 times. Could you tell us a little bit about this, this bill and several other police accountability bills that you are proposing in this legislative session? Sure. So uh, working on police accountability has been an issue that I've been consistent on, um, and it's something I've consistently worked on. And basically, um, what I've found over and over again is that we do not have a good way to track um, the amount of force that police officers are using, nor do we really in this country as a whole track who police are using force on. And so one of the things as I was looking at, you know, finding ways to compile information, I discovered that, you know, in 2019, that was when the FBI first started to track um, police use of force. And it was because of the national conversation that we've been having about police accountability. Mm -hmm. But this database that the FBI has um, is a voluntary database. So that means police departments do not have to submit use of force information. In addition to that, um, police departments generally a lot of times just report if a firearm was discharged or if there was a death in the result of a police interaction. And we know that there are plenty of things that happen um, that do not involve discharging a firearm or someone ending up dead that is still police use of force. So for me, um, you know, obviously I felt like that was not good enough. Um, so I filed a bill, House Bill 636. And this bill basically tasked Georgia with setting up a use of force database where basically the information would be tracked about what 
what amount of force is being used by police officers. And this database also would be open to the public because these are things that we need to know. You know, the other thing is that the FBI database that they've set up does not um, really tell you anything about the victims of uh, police use of force. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, again, in trying to show the disparities, um, we know that what happened, what can happen to black and brown people at the hands of police is mm -hmm. not what can happen to any white person in this country. If you think that what happened to Sandra Bland would happen to any white woman, you are mistaken. Um, we know that in our community, a lot of times police are making different decisions that are not um, in our best interest. And as a result, that is why we continue to see these incidents of police um, misconduct or use of force come up. Yeah. And so um, I, 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 you're a different type of uh, elected official. Um, you're very engaging to the, to the community and to your constituency. What, what brought you, what, what background did you have to this type of um, advocacy that, that led you to the Georgia General Assembly? Well, so yes, you're correct. Um, I only ran, so I came from a background in my personal time of community organizing and activism work, working on issues like police accountability, working on reproductive justice and health issues, working on economic justice issues. So you think about campaigns like Fight for 15, you think about um, local campaigns where we've seen like where we all had to come together as a community to get the officer indicted who shot Anthony Hill. Um, Seeing so many of those situations continue to come up and not really seeing elected officials in a real way come out and say, listen, this stuff has got to stop and I'm willing to work to make sure that we actually see um, progressive reforms put in place. That is what gave me the animus to run. And so I did run. And, um, you know, I always tell people I ran because of the issues. I stay because of the issues. And any day that it's not about the issues, that's when it's time for me to retire. Yeah. And you've done some some phenomenal things, including on the floor uh, last last session when um, they were arguing um, that the heartbeat bill, uh, you stayed on the floor past your time and you were going to put your your body in harm's way to protect women's reproductive rights. I mean, that was that was. Uh, and exhilarating. What 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 gave you that type of courage to do that? Well, sure. So it really is coming from a background of community organizing and uh, being an activist. You end up doing a lot of direct action. You know, this was not my first rodeo with direct action. I was one of those people when uh, the fight for 15 camp campaigns were really active. I would go to work and on my lunch break, stand outside at a Fight for 15 rally, um, you know, talking about how we need to make sure that fast food workers actually are being paid a living wage. So for me, when it came down to, you know, standing against this heartbeat bill, which essentially would outlaw abortion, I knew that we did not have filibuster in Georgia. And if you don't know, filibuster is essentially where you can go up, you get time to speak um, against or for a bill, and you just keep talking, 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 talking until you just literally tire people out and they get up and leave and you can end up basically preventing a bill from being voted on. We don't have that in Georgia. So mm -hmm. because we don't have the right to filibuster as elected representatives in Georgia, I said, you know what, I if they put this bill on the floor that would essentially outlaw abortion, I will make the speaker physically remove me from the floor. I will talk so long that he will have to have somebody physically remove me. And that's exactly what I did. I got up to speak. The speaker, after a certain amount of time, cut off my mic. I continued to talk. And so eventually he had uh, Capitol Police uh, physically remove me from the well. And I don't, I don't regret what I did, and I would do it again. Because, again, it's about the issues. And I'm not going to allow um, folks to just remove women's or anybody's bodily autonomy and their rights. Um, and I'm just going to sit back and treat it like a tax bill. That's not going to happen. That's not why I ran for office. And we do appreciate you for elevating your voice that way and, and being um, a role model for so many Georgians, but particularly so many uh, women in Georgia. And I mean, all I could think of at that moment was she persisted. And so <laughs> it, it was a, it was amazing to watch that. Um, so I kind of want to wrap this up. Um, what's what's next on the agenda uh, and what do you want to leave the people with? So really what's next is we really, really, you know, you saw how effective it was for everybody to, uh, you know, basically use their voice and, and do a lot of pushback um, against the budget. That same formula of making your voice heard and um, letting your elected officials know where you stand on issues can be replicated over and over again. And so what I really want to encourage folks to do is to please stay engaged with what we're doing. I know it's tough. People have jobs. They have families. But again, if you get if you follow somebody that you trust 
and they are consistently sending you information on the issues that you care about, please continue to activate, continue to use your voice. I promise you, you are not alone. And there are many things that are happening in Georgia that are not in the the, the right direction um, that you want to see as far as policy reforms. And so please continue to use your voice. Contact your legislators. Um, don't just assume that because you've elected somebody who aligns with your party that they are voting the way that you want them to vote. You must exercise your voice and you must speak up. And I know you have an election coming up. I want to give you the floor to talk to people about uh, why they should vote for Renita Shannon and why they should go to RenitaShannon.com and to make a donation to your campaign. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, yes, I am up for a re-election this year. Now, I will caution you, you're not allowed to donate to me uh, while we're in session, but once session is over, then you can donate. But I, the, the thing you asked me earlier about what makes me different um, as an elected official, because I do seem to stand out from others, and that's because I use a lot of my life experience to inform my um, decision, my policy making. So, for example, I tell my personal abortion story all the time because I don't want there to be any shame in women deciding to do, people doing what is right for them. And so so I really use my personal experiences to inform my policy making. You know, one of the reasons that I go so hard on criminal justice issues is because when I was in college, actually, 20 years ago, I found out myself just how easily people can be ensnared in the criminal justice system with without even hardly doing anything. Um, I was a, um, a college student at the University of Florida in uh, Gainesville, Florida. And, you know, at the time I was working to pay tuition, pay rent, just all the things that you're trying to do to keep yourself above water um, as a college student. And I had a situation where I came home one day and there was a voicemail on my answer machine from the Alachua County Sheriff's Department. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. So you're really yeah. surprised. I, imagine how surprised I was I'm because definitely surprised. Right. At this point in my life, I had never been arrested for anything. And, and even to this day, I've never been arrested for anything. I've never been convicted of any crime, never even had to go to court for anything, mm -hmm. um, you know, for myself. I've never even been a witness in a court for anything. So I, you know, up until that point, I had very little interaction with the criminal justice system. So I come home and there is a message from the Alachua County Sheriff's Office saying, you know, Miss Shannon, we have um, there are two checks that you have bounced with a supermarket. And if you do not contact us and pay for these checks, we will um, put out an, a, a warrant for your arrest. Now, who has never bounced a check in their life? I don't know anybody who's never bounced a check in their life, especially, you know, being in college. Especially college students. Yeah. So I nearly had a heart attack because, number one, I didn't even know that I had any bounce checks out there. So I had mm -hmm. two checks that were totaling almost $120 combined, and mm -hmm. they were ready to lock me up. So I'm thankful that the sheriff's office had my correct contact information because, you know, as a college student, you move a lot. Mm -hmm. You move every year chasing affordable rent. So exactly. it's hard for your contact information to stay consistent. So I call the sheriff's office back and um, they said, you know, listen, this is not a big deal. But if you take care of the checks, we'll drop the entire matter. So I remember that day I put on my shoes immediately mm -hmm. after just getting home from work. I contacted the retailer. And I paid for the checks, paid the fees, and then I took the proof down to the courthouse. And they said, okay, everything is dismissed. You won't even have to go to court for this. The, the whole incident is completely handled. But what that taught me was, you know, what I think about, when I think about that situation, I think about what if I would not have gotten that message? Mm. I mean, <laughs> oh, what if the sheriff's office had the incorrect phone number for me? What if I would not have received that message? Or what if I didn't have the ability to pay? You know, these were two checks that I had no idea had even bounced. And this was 20 years ago that this happened to me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, again, I mean, I know that I am lucky, um, number one, that they were able to get a hold of me. Um, I'm lucky that I took care of it and that they did not decide to prosecute me. I'm lucky that, um, you know, that the whole situation worked out, you know, very well. But I can also see in that same situation how easily it could have just gone the other way for something as simple as bouncing a check, which everyone has done. And so that is one of the experiences that really informs, um, you know, informs me. And so because you look at the effect that that could have had on my life um, after graduating college, I mostly worked for financial services companies and I worked for pharmaceutical and medical device companies. Now, those companies, if you have any fraud conviction in your background, if you have anything that tells them that it is not OK to trust you with money, those companies will not hire you. And those are some really good jobs. So once again, 
If I had not had the opportunity to go and take care of the checks, and if I had not had the opportunity to um, clear up my situation, and if they would have aggressively moved forward with prosecuting me and putting a charge on my record, there is a possibility that I would not have had the great jobs that I've had in my life because I would have been barred from that. Um, In addition to, even now, 20 years later, internet background checks, you can still see two charges of worthless check on my background, even though... The sheriff's office, I cleared it up immediately, was never prosecuted, was never arrested, was never convicted of anything. So that examples like things like experiences like that in my life really inform me when it comes to policy making. And I think that that is a reason why when I see policy on paper, I don't think of it as just words on a paper. Mm -hmm. I think about the real life impact that these policies will have on people's lives and I, with conviction and courage, I vote my conscience. And that's why we appreciate you, especially in the, in the 84th. Um, and so I just thank you. The platform is always open to you. This thank is the you. reason for uh, Justice Fighter Podcast on Justice Media. Um, if you don't have anything else, I'm going to wrap this up. As I appreciate you coming on the platform. And uh, we look forward to the continuation of the Georgia General Assembly this this session and hopefully killing some bad bills and putting some good bills together and making sure we move Georgia forward in a progressive manner. So I truly appreciate you coming on Justice Fighter Podcast. This is Attorney Griggs, a Justice Fighter, and I approve this message. This is Attorney Gerald Griggs, a Justice Fighter. I don't think they ready for you, Attorney Griggs. Justice Fighter.